Today, we're continuing in our series called The Goal. Come on, somebody say The Goal. How many of you all have any goals in life? Let me see by a show of hands. Please lift your hand up wherever you are at your screen. Um, What would you say your number one goal as a Christian should be? Ready, go. Hopefully, you know by now, okay? Um, Is it to get your degree? Is it to succeed in your career? Is it to get married? Have kids? Retire early, make six figures, seven figures, eight figures, nine figures. (laughs) No, (laughs) all of those are great goals, and we hope that they come to pass for you. But the number one goal, somebody say number one. What I'm talking about today is priority. Thank God for all of those other goals. But the number one goal is to be like Jesus. This series is about spiritual maturity. Do you feel yourself growing spiritually and emotionally? My God, I hope that you are. You know, there's a scripture that Tabitha and I have used. It's kind of like the springboard scripture for our life. It's Matthew 6, 33, and it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. Your other goals are going to be released as you put him as the number one goal. Don't miss the principle. The principle is a principle of priority, that when God is first, he gets involved with everything else that's second and third. But if God is not first, he won't help your goals come to pass. We live by this, and hopefully you will as well. Somebody say amen. And so here we are again, guys, at the goal. Last week, we taught a message called Character Over Charisma. If you missed that message, make sure that you download it. Matter of fact, if you heard it, you want to listen to it again, get it in your spirit. Um, How many of you all enjoyed that message, character over charisma? This is kind of like the heartbeat of (laughs) of who we are as a church. And so last week we talked about that, and I want to teach like a sister message today. These are like twins. They're like twin babies. They they go together. Um, Last week we talked about character. This week I want to talk about holiness. So today's message is called A Hunger for Holiness. And my hope in you is to stir and also to release a hunger for holiness. To me, it's almost like they got to go together. I was telling my, um, my, my viewing audience here, like, I love to teach about living right. I love to teach about character and everything because I think one of the worst advertisements for us is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the stage actor. It's not saying, hey, I'm a mess, I need some help. It's the person who act like they got it all together, but they don't. And, I, and I'm telling you that that turns people off to Christianity because they want to see, can you walk the way that you talk? And it's something about our preaching lining up with our living that gives an example to everybody that we've been changed and transformed. And so today's message is a, a hunger for holiness, all right? And um, I, here's the thing. I believe that, like, character, just to, I don't even know if you can divide these two, but I'm going to try my best to define them and divide them. Okay, so to me, you have holiness as the, as the foundation that gives birth to good character. It's almost like if holiness is the field, the seed of character blossoms in that field. It's almost like, to me, that's the preeminent. Holiness is the preeminent one. Do you want to, why is that? Because there's ungodly people that have good character. And y'all know I'm telling you the truth. There's people, they vegan and they eat all organic and they're doing yoga somewhere. They don't believe anything in Jesus, but they're faithful. They're reliable. They keep their word. They're trustworthy. They'll be there for you and all of that. So there are some people that they have character. It's not necessarily godly character. Now, I believe godly character is where his anointing and grace can help you have godly character. But make no mistake about it. There are some people that aren't followers of Christ at all that I would trust them with doing my taxes and helping me in business more and I, <laughs> I trust the believer that's, you know, throwing oil on everything. Praise God for you. But I believe that we need both. But, okay, but we also have this, but one thing that, the, um, that an unbeliever can't have is holiness. They can't have holiness. Now, they can have character, but they can't have holiness. So I believe that holiness is the foundation in which good character is grown. And so what is character? Write this down. It's moral excellence, all right? It's moral excellence. It deals with Uh, the things on the outside and, you know, well, it's on the inside, but then it develops fruit on the outside, okay? Um, Let's look at 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 13, okay? We need both, we need both, we need both, right? We need character and we need holiness. 1 Peter 1 and 13, it says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. How many of y'all know Jesus is coming back? Verse 14, as obedient children, 
Do not conform. There's a pressure to conform to the world. Don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived, everybody say lived, in ignorance. Lived, circle that, that means past tense. (laughs) Meaning that there has to come a place where you say who I used to be is in the past. It's not in my present. I used to live this way. I used to just cuss everybody out. And there comes a place where you're like, oh my God, I ain't said that in six months. Okay, you're being transformed now. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for you to grow in the spirit of holiness. That's good news, okay? There used to be a time where you just sleep around with everybody and they're like, oh my God, I've kept myself to myself for the last six, 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 six weeks. Let's give you six weeks, all right? And what's that? That's where we want, want to get to, to where though, that's the way you used to live. It's not like I'm dragging that old man into my new relationship with Christ. No, that's the way I used to live when I was ignorant. We say ignorant. (laughs) That means that you didn't have any knowledge of the Son of God or that he was the bar setter or he was the example, but now you do. Verse 15, but it says, but watch this because this is the command here. Are you ready for this? Somebody say, I'm ready for this one. It says, but just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. What? The bar is set here. This is the goal. The bar is this is that God is holy, and he wants us to be holy too. It's almost this thing where we're like, okay, God's holy, but not me. You know, not, I, I, can't, I can't reach that level, but God says, no, I'm setting the bar. I'm setting your goal here that I'm holy, and I've made you in my image and in my likeness, so you're going to be holy because I'm holy. Verse 16, for it says, it's been written or it's been prophesied, be holy because I am holy. All right? So I don't know what your goals are, but my goal is to be be more like Jesus, who is holy. So write this down. Our God is holy, and he expects us to be holy because he is, okay? The bar is high, and he's going to give us grace to be able to get there. Now, I know some of you all are like, well, I'm just little old me, and I make so many mistakes. Don't say that no more. Start to say that you're growing in the image and likeness of Christ. You know him better, and you're serving him more faithfully. And even if you mess up, his grace is sufficient to help you, okay? All right, so write this down. The ability to define gives us the ability to fulfill, okay? The ability, you can't fulfill that which you don't define, okay? Now, if you want to be a husband, um, you got to go say, how has the Bible said a husband is to be? If you want to be a good parent, you got to go, you got to define it before you can fulfill it. You're not a husband just because you went to the wedding and said, I do, until you realize that the Bible says a husband loves his wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It is the highest form of love. You cannot fulfill what you do not define. You're not a parent just because you had a baby. When the Bible says you should train them up in the way they should go so when they are old, they will not depart. That's your job to be the example setter, not just have a baby, okay? You, can't, you cannot define, you cannot fulfill what you've not defined. Even as a pastor, I can't allow you all to put your definition of what you think a pastor is to be upon me. I got to go to God's word because if I don't go to God's word, you're going to stress me out because you're going to think that I'm supposed to show up at every funeral, every birthday celebration, throw oil on your new car. You're going to have all of these expectation from whatever church you came from, or if you've never been to church before, you can say, a pastor is supposed to do this, and I cannot fulfill what I have not defined. And I go back to the word. I'm supposed to feed you knowledge and understanding to equip you to do the work of the ministry to come into full measure, and I'm going to do the best I can at that where the church say amen. And so we want to define some things today. I want to define this word righteousness. Please write that down. Right. Everybody say righteousness. Say it like you love it. It's a word that we don't use. It's not... It's, It's not a secular word. This is a very Bible word. But my God, we need to know how to define this word so we can fulfill this word. All right? What is righteousness? Write this down. It means to be in right standing with God. Would somebody say amen? So when you accept Jesus, you are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Here's the question. So if you accept Jesus and you are righteous... What if you do something unrighteous? Or what if you make a mistake or you fall into sin? Now, I'm not talking about habitual sin, willful sin, where you're like, I'm just going to do it. I don't care. That's, that's another message for another day. I'm talking about people that you're like, oh, my God, you feel bad about the mistake. There's some remorse there, right? Does that change your righteousness? No, it does not. Because you are not made righteous based upon what you do. You're made righteous based upon what he's done. 
This is so important to our Christianity because our belief is not based upon works, lest anybody would be able to boast. It is not based upon self-righteousness. Now, like I said last week, there's a lot of self-righteousness in the atmosphere. You ask people, how are you with God? Oh, I'm good. I'm a good person. I do a lot of good things. I follow the golden rule. All of that is what we call self-righteousness. You think that you will be okay with God because you're a good person, but the Bible says your good works are filthy rags before a holy God. And so what it means to be righteous, it's meaning that because I know I can't be right enough, I'm accepting what Jesus did on the cross. And I believe by faith that when I accept what he did on the cross, I'm not made righteous by what I do. I'm made righteous by what he's done. And the only thing I do is accept what he's done. And the Bible says my nature is changed from a sinner to a saint, and I am in right standing with God. Even if I make a mistake, my standing don't change. Even if I mess up, my standing don't change. Come on, somebody. You should be excited to be a born-again believer because you don't have to be perfect even though we're striving for perfection because you are the righteousness of God through and by Christ Jesus. Are y'all here with me today? I love this scripture here, and it says this in... um, Oh, let me find it real quick. Uh, is this my notes? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Whew. God knew, made Jesus the Lamb of God who knew no sin. Can you imagine Jesus? He was tempted at every point like we were, we, we, we can be. He's been tempted to lust, tempted to fornicate, tempted with adultery, homosexuality. He's been tempted at every point, but he did not sin. And so he was the perfect, blameless, spotless lamb of God to pay the price for all of our sin. He took it on his body. And so when we accept Jesus, we are made the righteousness. Of God. I love this. Let's look at the word sanctification. Let's define it so we can fulfill it. Righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. <laughs> sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means to make holy, to set apart as sacred, to consecrate. You know, James, these words, sanctification and consecration, they go very closely together. Holiness. All these things are very closely. They're just they're a little bit different, but very close. It means to purify, to be free from sin. We want to be sanctified. I like to say it this way. It is the process of becoming holy. Please write that down. It is, what is sanctification? It is the process of becoming holy. Righteousness is an event. You accept Jesus and you say, I call on the name of the Lord. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. Salvation is an event. Righteousness is an event. All right, But after you are made righteous, it does not mean that you're a Christian or you resemble Christ. Sanctification is the process that leads to transformation. Stephen, very quickly, Pastor Eric, jump up real quick. Let me show you something very quickly. Y'all hearing? I know you weren't expecting this, so I need you to hurry, 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 hurry. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Watch this. Stand right here. Stand right here. Stand right there. Okay? This is, this is salvation. So you accept Jesus. Hey, Lord, I'm here. I surrender my heart by lifting my hand. Out of my mouth, I confess. Ba-ba. What happens? He's made righteous, yeah. even if he does not live righteously. Now, here's the thing. People say, well, does that mean that I can sin and do whatever I want to do and God will forgive me? Here's the key. Righteous people are never looking for excuses to sin. They are always looking for ways out of sin. Yeah. Righteous people always want to live righteously, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So here's the thing. So if you're that person that you are in habitual sin and you don't feel bad about it, there's no remorse, I question whether you're really saved. You need to get saved today. So there should be a conviction on the inside of you. This is what we call salvation. He's been made righteous. This is what we call transformation, okay? He's been transformed by the renewing of his mind. He is, let's say he's the full measure of Christ. He is the goal. He's what we're going after, okay? But in between salvation and transformation lies sanctification, Sanctification is this process where I am being saved. The Bible is very complex read. It says that you are saved, you're being saved, and you're going to be saved. And sometimes you can read that and say, okay, am I saved or not? Yes. It just depends on how you want to unfold the word. You are saved and you can have confidence in that, but you are being saved or you're being sanctified, transformed by the renewing of your mind to be the full measure of Christ Jesus, and at his coming, you will be completely saved. Will somebody say amen? God bless you and give them guys a big round of applause. 
It's what we call sanctification. Now, let's go to the next word, and this is the word holiness. Everybody say holiness. And holiness and sanctification is very closely related. And write this definition down. It means to be set apart. That's all that it means. When you say, hey, I want to be, I want to live holy. I'm holy. That means that you've been set apart. Okay. Now, the word sanctified also means being set apart. So it's an event but it's also a process. So you're set apart at salvation, but then you go through the process of being set apart. You're set apart at salvation with holiness, but then you go through a process. I hope I'm not confusing you. I'm just trying to give you the best that I can on this. And the words both have similar meanings. Both of them doesn't speak to an event, but to a process. Similar words for holiness is it means to be moral, to be innocent. Come on, somebody. To be pure to be chaste, to be blameless. We need all of that. Here's my practical definition of holiness. Are y'all ready? To line our lives up with God's word. (laughs) It ain't hard. It's real easy. To line our lives up with God's word. Psalm 119 and 9, it says, listen to this. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? How can an old person, take the age out of it for a minute, how can you stay on the path of holiness and righteousness, purity and being chaste by living according to your word? Holiness isn't some deep spiritual term. It's just you doing what the Bible says. So if the Bible, you read the Bible and the Bible says flee fornication and you read that, what you do is you go home, you pack up your stuff and you move out and you sleep on your BFF's couch just for six weeks until you figure out what you're going to do or you get married. And as soon as you do that, holiness is birthed. It ain't hard, y'all. You know what I'm saying? If you get paid and you realize in Malachi 3, it says to bring all of the tithe, 10% of your increase to the house of God as a form of trust and obedience and worship to God. That means God goes off the bottom of your budget. He goes to the top. So you don't go to Starbucks before giving to the Lord. You don't get your hair or your nails done before giving to the Lord. You say, okay, when God gives to me, the first thing I do is I give back to him first. And as soon as you do that, holiness is born. When somebody that you don't like at work and you read the Bible and it says, overcome evil with good, and you go and buy them lunch, (laughs) and you go and be nice to that relative that you about can't stand, the Bible says it's like dumping coals of fire on their head. Okay, holiness is born. That's all holiness is. When you say, you know what? I got my way, but I submit to his way. I got my will, but I want to submit to his will. The Bible says that's, that's when holiness is born. So what I'm talking about today, guys, is just we, we need to live right. That's all this is. We just, we need to live right. I really believe that if we can just say, God, I want, to live, I want to be pleasing in your eyes. I'm not talking about legalism and what we got to do. When people preach holiness, they preach it in a box, and you start messing with my hair and my tats and all. Like, leave me alone because holiness is an inside job first and an outside job second, and we think we can dress up holiness. And so many times we have people in churches that they dress up on the outside, still sleeping around, lying and revengeful and, re- and all of that stuff on the inside because we dress up something instead of being transformed on the inside of us. So we got to live right, y'all. Are y'all ready for this? And you say, Pastor, why are you so excited to live right? Because I just believe that we carry a greater anointing. And we get to carry the kabod of the Lord and the presence of the Lord and the joy that's unspeakable and that we should speak the mountains and they be removed. And the Bible talks about how he will show himself strong for those who know their God and he will do great exploits. We just got to know him better and serve him more faithfully. It's so good to be saved. But we make being saved like something that's difficult and we got to just, we can't be creative. We can't be fun. We got to live inside of all of these boxes. And Jesus, I love Jesus because he crushed the box. But listen, we got to be holy people and give our bodies as worship back to the Lord. But man, we can have peace that passes understanding, and we can walk in authority and dominion, and we can live in prosperity and promotion and productivity. Would the church please say amen? And so I look at it like this. Let's say you're Superman, and your kryptonite is sin. I mean, you got superhuman powers. Think about it. 
Superman is like a bad, 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 bad man when it comes to superheroes, okay? Let's assume you're like Superman. You can lay hands on the sick and they be recovered. You can go and pray and call down fire from heaven. You can speak to the mountain and the mountain be removed. You can decree a thing and it shall be established. The Bible says for you to covet the best gifts, revelation, power gifts, vocal gifts, all of those gifts flowing through your life, the working of miracles. But all you got to do is stay away from the kryptonite. Like Superman knows, like, listen, if it's kryptonite on the scene, on the scene I'm going the other way. I'm bad. I can blow on stuff. I, can, I don't need no Iron Man suit. Superman, he fly out of space. Superman show up, but if kryptonite is there, he's like, I'm gone. I can't mess with the kryptonite. <laughs> like, like, I'm bad as I want to be. I'm powerful as I want to be. But if the kryptonite is on the scene, I cannot mess with the kryptonite. And some of y'all are scared of the devil, and the devil is like Lex Luger. The devil ain't got no power. All of the authority that he has has been taken away from him. When Jesus went to hell and took the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave, all he does is try to make, he tries to set the kryptonite trap up for Superman. You ain't got to be scared of the devil. Be scared of the sin that the devil is trying to entice you with. It's not Lex Luger. It's the kryptonite. And so what the devil does is he tries to lure you in by sin so that you can get around the kryptonite to zap your anointing. Come on, somebody. But I'm here for the supermans. Would you please stand up and rise up and be who God's called you to be? And listen, if you see sin, just go the other way. It's the only thing that can stop you. It's the only thing that can hinder you. It's the only thing that can slow you down. And I'm not here preaching as a perfect person like I got it all together. I'm just smart enough to stay away from the kryptonite. I just want to stay away from the sin so I can walk in power. Come on, somebody. That, to me, it just makes logical sense. But anyway, so anyway... Um, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's good news today. Man, that means because I preach on holiness and some people feel condemned and the devil begins to tell you, you're a mess up. You're a failure. The devil is a liar. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I don't care what you did last night. I want to know what you're going to do on tomorrow. He is faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so I love this. If we confess our sins, you can't confess what you don't acknowledge. So all holiness begins with getting out of denial. I'm good. No, you ain't good. <laughs> you ain't good. Your marriage is broken. You ain't heard from the Lord in six months. You ain't good. All, all holiness starts with saying, you know what? I got some sin in my life and my attitude, some prejudice there. I got some stereotypical thoughts there. I got some grudges, some unforgiveness there. I compare people. I'm, 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 I got a little pornography thing that I don't want anybody to know. The first thing we do, confess our sins. It's faithful and just. My God, forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Say this with me, God, purify me. Second Corinthians 7, 1, watch this one. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything, meaning that God ain't going to do it for you. He's already done everything he's going to do on the cross. You're going to have to take the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and purify yourself. And it doesn't say from some things. I know how we got things in our life that we, don't, we want to touch. He says, purify yourself from everything that contaminates body and spirit. What contaminates your body? What you're putting in it? What you're putting on it? What you're doing with it? And your spirit. And then it says, perfecting holiness and reverence for God, meaning that we're going to grow in this thing. Holiness ain't something that just drops out of the sky. It's every single day I'm going to grow in holiness, my God. Watch this one in Romans chapter 6, verse 19. It says, I'm using it as an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slave to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so offer yourselves now as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Y'all know that's good preaching. How many of y'all used to be a slave to them cigarettes? I mean, you was a slave to that, that booty call. I mean, you, you know that call that comes to it. You, you was a slave to that. You was a slave to people's opin opinions, people approval. Now, you're supposed to be a slave to God. Verse 20, it says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And that's where our world is today. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm free to be me. But you are a slave to unrighteousness and don't even know it. You are a slave to that perversion. You are, a, and don't even know it, all right? But now when we accept Jesus, we are free from being slaves to unrighteousness, verse 21. And it says this, but what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? 
How many of y'all, back in the day, you did some things that you kind of wish you wouldn't have done? Can I get a raise of hands in this place? I mean, anybody, come on, online? Yeah, all them things that I did, man, I'm not, I'm not proud of those things, right? Those things, it resulted in death, verse 22. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. What a powerful passage of Scripture. Hebrews 12, 14, one more. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Make every effort, okay? So there's always going to be an interpersonal conflict. Make every effort to live in peace. Do everything you can. And then it says, also make every effort to live holy. Put boundaries around you, you know, accountability measures around you. Don't give in to things that you think can lead you the appetizers always lead towards the main course. I always say that. Make every effort to live holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. How many of y'all want to see Jesus? Now, I'm not sure exactly what that, scriptures mean, that scripture means. I'm no theologian. I'm just a dude who loves Jesus and been doing this for a couple decades. Here's the thing. Whether it's see the Lord in heaven or see the Lord moving in my life right now, I want to see the Lord. <laughs> Anybody here online, you want to see the Lord? I want to see the Lord moving in my marriage, moving in my ministry, moving in my finances, moving in my heart, moving in my mind. And the Bible says that without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. We got to start to put a premium on just living right, giving our bodies and our minds and our emotions back to God pure without being tainted from the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? Amen. So how do we do this? How do we walk in the spirit of holiness? Number one, we have to substitute the sensual for the spiritual. Substitute <laughs> the sensual for the spiritual, okay? So right now, we are bombarded with so many images. I was just, I think I was flying to Washington, D.C. I don't know, I went to Texas. I think this is the D.C. flight. And I'm telling you, this thing leaves at 6 a.m. So I get up at 4, 4.30 to head to the airport. It's a 6 a.m. flight. And I'm sitting, um, I'm sitting on, the air, on the airplane. We're on the tarmac about to leave. It's 6.23. I looked at my clock because I couldn't believe it. And you know how you can see the TV of the people that are in front of you? And so two rows up, I noticed what a guy was watching. 6.23 in the morning. He was watching all this murder, and this guy had gotten shot, and he was laying in a pool of blood. And it was like he came back from the dead and he was going through all of these different images. And then one image, he shows up under a bed and there's these two women about to have sex with one another on the bed. And then the one woman leaves, he comes out of the bed and he begins to be intimate with this other woman. It's 623 in the morning. It's 6.23 in the morning, y'all. It's 6.23 in the morning. I'm like, that's how you start your day? Okay, okay, I see that's how you start your day. You start your day with all that murder and mayhem and adultery and sensuality. And then, and then we want to know why God seems so far because we have to replace the sensual with the spiritual. And, and here's what I need you to know. And, and I'm not trying to be all holier than thou, but I need you to know the heart of the pastor and the spirit of holiness that's in this church. I remember years ago, when I gave my heart to Jesus and I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I used to spend so much time with the Lord, I remember living outside of Washington, D.C. and there was a new Star Wars movie. It's PG-13. And I remember going to the movie, but I remember just my spirit wasn't comfortable. You ever been into a movie and it's just like, you know what, I got to go. Like I went to Medea's, like the last Medea, and it was all these sexual into windows and all of this foul language. I got up in the middle of the movie and left because I don't know what has happened to us to where we've been so desensitized to evil to now we're entertained by it. We're entertained. Come on, think about video games. How many murders do we see every year? How many suicides do we see every year? How many affairs do we see every year? How many terrorist attacks do we see every year? And we call it a movie. We call it entertainment. We're literally taking our money to put things on our soul. And then we wake up in the middle of the night and we want to know why we don't have sweet sleep because we're putting the wrong thing on this precious thing called our imagination. And I'm not here to be holier than now. I'm just here to encourage you to 
to be a tad bit more sensitive to what you put in, it affects what comes out. Holiness doesn't happen overnight. It happens when we are desensitized. It's almost like we need a bath from the world. It's almost like we need a soul detox to everything that is going on around us to where now we think that's the normal and we think that holiness is weird when it should be the reverse to where the murder and the mayhem and the adultery is weird and being with Jesus is the norm. I got a lot more to say, but I don't know if you can handle it. <laughs> Number two is that you got to live beyond the gray, beyond the gray. Say it with me. Beyond the gray. Come on, say it with me. Beyond the gray. Come on, put it in the chat. Beyond the gray. Come on, get you a tattoo that says I'm beyond the gray because I need to get this in your spirit. It's a book that I wrote that I haven't released yet, <laughs> but it's, called, it's a principle called Beyond the Gray because the Bible is not black and white about everything. It don't tell you what to do on your first date or how far is too far. It, it, there's so much gray area. And what my message is this, live as a child of God beyond the gray. All right. Now, here's some questions that you can ask yourself to figure out if it's beyond the gray. Ask yourself this, does what I'm about to do lead me closer to Jesus or not? Nah? All right. Well, the Bible doesn't say this. Okay. Does that help your anointing or not? Nah? Does what I'm about to do, does it have the ability, if overabused, to lead me away from Jesus? Because if that's the case, maybe you should put it on the altar. Just maybe. Maybe it's a gray area. Okay, how about this one? Does the Bible say negative and positive things about it, or is the Bible silent about it, but you have a multitude of counsel around you that's saying that's not wise? Uh, just think about it for a second. All right, all right. Here's a question to ask. If somebody else saw me doing it, could it possibly be a stumbling block for them? And if you ask yourself these questions, I know people want to debate. They want to debate everything. It's like, oh, well, Jesus turned water into wine and herb is in the Bible, so I'm smoking this bag of weed. It's like, oh, no, that word ain't in the Bible. That cuss word ain't in the Bible. You can't show it to me in the Scripture. Please, people. Please, 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 please. Holiness is not trying to make up reasons why it's okay for me to be ratchet. Holiness is where I say, I want to put everything out of my life that could lead me away from Jesus, and I want to bring everything in my life that will grow me in the anointing and bring me out of this realm to a whole nother realm. And for those of you all that knows what I'm talking about, there is another realm that we get to live on where it's almost like an, where an eagle is, where you can see the destruction and mayhem that's going on, but it doesn't move you like it moves everybody else. And I think that the reason that some of us are really so stressed with everything that we've been through is because we're not living from up here. We're not seated in high places with Christ Jesus. We're feeling it like everybody else is feeling it, and you haven't been graced for that space. Are y'all with me? Number three. <laughs> Number three, be sensitive to the gentle convictions of the Holy Spirit. Whatever we got to do to turn up the Holy Spirit, gentle convictions. Don't go on that date. <clears throat> Don't take the job. Don't fall for that offense. <clears throat> Don't call him back. <clears throat> Just stay away from her. Nope, that's not the person for you to listen to. Nope, don't download that. Mm -mm, don't go to that website. <sighs> The Holy, the Holy Ghost is our paracletos. He's with us to help us fill in all of the gray areas where the Logos Word of God kind of leaves off. Number four, fight for repentance as a lifestyle. Get up in the morning. Repentance means I'm changing my mind and I'm changing direction. It's not like I repent one time. It's a lifestyle. God, forgive me. I'm going the other way. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And for the sake of time, number five, you got to leave it on the altar, y'all. And there are some things, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to stop with this today because I know that this is an online service, but I want to give you an opportunity to leave some things on the altar. Grab a piece of paper very quickly or, or pick out your phone. If you don't have a piece of paper, get out your phone very quickly. And I want to ask you to write down anything that you know could be standing in between your soul and your Savior, any attitude or any action, anything that you're like, you know what, I need this out of my life. I want you to write it down. The altar is a place of sacrifice. Fire falls on sacrifice. Passion falls on sacrifice. Power falls on sacrifice. And I want to give you an opportunity to put these things in your phone, put these things on paper, and if you're in your house, I'm gonna get, you can go to the toilet and flush it, go to the trash can, throw it away, or just delete it in just a moment. But I want you to set up an altar 
right where you are, where you're watching this. And I want you to write down the one thing that you're like, I got to get out of my life. This toxic relationship, this attitude, this behavior, this perspective. Maybe you got two things. Let's not do no more than three things. I want you to write down one, two, or three things. And I want to give an opportunity for church-wide repentance, but also church-wide holiness. This is what happened for me. 22 years old, I would lived for 10 years as a Christian atheist. I believed in God, but I lived like he didn't exist. 22 years old, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave me incredible power, the desire to understand the word, the desire to want to know God better. It opened me up to another realm. And some of you all need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I might, I, I would put that down. Start to go for him. You, you want a prayer language. You want everything that God has for you. It's not, not, nothing that he wants to hide from you. You just got to go after it. But the second and probably most powerful thing that happened to me is that he gave me a spirit of holiness. It was like all of a sudden, I was the guy trying to convince my wife to go out to DC Live still and go to the clubs and and I was unfaithful and I was flirting with other women and all of this kind of stuff. But when that spirit of holiness came in, like I said, I've been sober for 19 years. I haven't flirted with another woman in 19 years. I haven't used profanity in 19 years. Okay, that's not for you to say, well, I did that last night. No, it's not for you to feel bad. It's just to let you know that there is a spiritual transfer that happens. That when holiness, like real holiness comes in, the desire for other things can move out. It's not that I haven't been tempted, and it's not that I've been perfect in all things, but there is a literal spirit of holiness. Here's the thing. When people talk about a live church, they can talk about my orange jacket and my curly hair, and they can talk about we do groups well, we do creative well, we write songs, all these things, but what I really want them to say is that them people live right. That's really what I want people to say. Now, I can't control what people say, and I understand that not everybody's going to live right right away. We're going to give people space and grace to grow. We ain't going to judge them. We're going to let the Holy Ghost do that. But in this house, there's a spirit of holiness on me, on Tabitha, on our leadership team, on our pastors. Come on, somebody. On our group leaders, there is a spirit. And, let, and some people ain't going to like our church. And they're going to say, well, I don't like this and that. The truth is they don't want to live right yet. And I'm okay with my temperature being hotter than others. You got to be okay with that. You got to be okay with people that's like, I don't know about if I want to do all that. That's okay. You can go to another church because here we 212. We at the boiling point. We want to know him better. We are God chasers. We have a spirit of holiness that's in the house. And as you're writing those things down, I feel like I want to pray that over you today. And I want you to have that same encounter with the Holy Ghost that I did 20 years ago. And so... Can you just bow your head and just say, Father, forgive me. Just talk to the Lord for a moment. I don't want this attitude. I'm putting this on the altar. I want to be more submitted. I'm letting go of that resentment. I'm letting go of that bitterness, that hurt, that anger. God, forgive me for worry. Forgive me for, for my prejudice ideology. Forgive me for eye for an eye. Forgive me for my anger and my, my use of language. Come on, whatever it is, the secret things, the unsecret things, pornography, whatever it is, put it all on the altar. God, take this away from me. Okay? This is the altar. It's the altar of your heart. Okay? Now, whether it's on your phone or whether you're balling up that piece of paper, do that symbolically saying, I'm done with that. I'm putting away the old man and I'm receiving that which is new. And I'm going to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I release the spirit of holiness right now. I thank you that every single person that is watching this message, listening to this message, that it's not based upon the chronological timing of you, but the Kairos moments of you, no matter when it is and where it is, I thank you that it has your stamp of approval. That right now there is a mantle of holiness that our church is grabbing hold of. And we are grabbing hold of it, not in a legalistic way, but we're grabbing hold of it in a fun-filled, faith-filled that I get to live completely for the Lord. He provides everything that I need emotionally and spiritually, and I thank you, Lord that all of the temptation of yesterday, you make a way of escape. I bind it in the name of Jesus, the spirit of ridicule and persecution and fear and worry and lust, perversion, and I loose the spirit of holiness right now. And so from this day forward, I declare it's in our heart. It's upon us, it's in us, it's on us. And that we will be a church that resembles heaven as we move towards the goal. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here, you're listening to this today, and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, could you just kind of lift up a hand where you are and just say, God, yep, that's me. 
I want to get right with you. I want to get right with you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. Say, from this day forward, I give you me. Not some of me, but all of me. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Would you put your hands together and just let's thank God. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's thank the Lord. Welcome to the family of the Lord. I'm so excited that you have made that decision today. If you got saved, please text the word save to the number that is on the bottom of the screen or reach out to us in the chat box. We want to pray for you, get you some other information. Also, we want to help you find family, okay? We want to help you be a part of this family. We have an online growth track. We want to help you grow in the spirit of holiness. I'm so thankful for the prayer, but we want to walk with you through it as well. And if you want to be a part of our growth track, please reach out to us in the chat. It's online every Sunday at one o'clock. Give us two weeks. We'll help you get connected, discover your purpose, and make a difference. I love you guys, and we will see you real soon. God bless you.